Namaskar, dear learners and listeners. I am Anita Devraj, and today I am back again with another episode of Modern India. All of us, at some point in our lives, have to be loyal to our country. Now, this loyalty to our country may be generally understood as nationalism. Now, a nationalist is a person who loves his country. You may find statements of this kind in novels and poetry, speeches and newspapers, and also films. Have you ever wondered when all this may have begun? What is the history of nationalism? How old is this idea? Does the word nationalism carry any other meaning apart from a feeling of loyalty for one's country? Now, these are the questions that I shall try to answer in this program. Trace the history of idea of nationalism also and explain the reasons for the rise of nationalism in Europe. Relate the growth of nationalism in India with the struggle against British colonialism and trace the emergence of ideas of nationalism in the field of culture in India and explain how nationalism was expressed in economic terms. Now, before we really start off, let me talk about the origin and meaning of the word nationalism. It may surprise you to learn that the history of this idea is not more than 200 years old. Nationalism in the sense in which we use it today did not exist in India before the 19th century. It may also surprise you to learn that the roots of this idea do not lie in the Indian history, but in the history of modern Europe. In fact, it is possible to talk of Indian nationalism as distinctly different from its European counterpart. In order to know this difference, it is important to have an idea of the circumstances under which nationalism took roots in Europe. In Europe, the development of nationalism was a result of the fundamental changes that were taking place in society and economy around the 18th century. The beginning of the Industrial Revolution produced goods and materials and created wealth at an unprecedented means which have never been seen before. This led to the need for the creation of a unified and large market where these goods could be sold. The creation of a large market led to a political integration of villages, districts and provinces into a larger state. In this large and complex market, different people were required to perform different roles for which they needed to be trained in different skills. But above all, they needed to communicate with each other. This created the need for uniform educational centers with focus on one language. In the pre-modern times, majority of the people learnt language and other skills in their local environments, which differed from each other. But now, because of the new changes brought about by modern economy, a uniform system of training and schooling came into being. Thus, modern English language in England, French in France and German in Germany became the dominant language in those countries. Uniformity in communication systems resulted in the creation of a national culture and reinforced national boundaries. People living within those boundaries began to associate themselves with it. Culturally, they also began to perceive themselves as one people and as members of one large community. That is, Englishmen began to identify with each other and with the geographical boundaries of England. Similarly, it happened to German and French people also. This was the beginning of the idea of nationalism. Now, let us try and understand this a little differently. Nationalism was the result of the emergence of nations and nation states, large, culturally homogeneous territories with a uniform political system within. In Europe did not always exist. The early societies with simpler forms of human organizations and without an elaborate division of labor could easily manage their affairs without a state as a central authority came into being after the beginning of organized agriculture. People generally found it difficult to manage their lives without a central authority to regulate their lives. This need for a state became even greater with the onset of industrialization 
and a modern world economy. An elaborate system of communication and a uniform system of education with focus on one standardized language created conditions for cultural and political uniformity. Thus came into being modern nation states. These nation states in order to sustain and perpetuate themselves needed the allegiance and loyalty of the people residing in their territories. This was the beginning of nationalism. In other words, an identification by a people or community with the boundary of the nation, state and its high culture gave rise to what we know as nationalism. But this was not how the idea of nationalism developed in India. Why did this happen? You know, the conditions in India were very different at a time when the idea of nationalism was taking roots in Europe. Industrialization occurred here on a very limited scale. When Europe was getting rapidly industrialized, India was still largely an agrarian economy. Different people spoke different languages. Though the feeling of patriotism, that is love and a feeling of loyalty for one's territory and culture like the one that existed among the Marathas for Marathwara or among the Rajputs for Rajputana certainly existed in India in pre-modern times. But nationalism as we understand it, that is with a unified system of administration, common language, a shared high culture and political integration did not exist in India until about the middle of the 19th century. Nationalism in India developed primarily as a response to the British rule. British rule as you know came to the Indian soil in 1757 with the battle of Plassey and gradually established here by defeating the native rulers. As you are aware, the arrival of the British as rulers was resented by many of the native rulers and people also. It was clear that they all wanted to oppose and fight against the British presence in India. But initially, they did not do it together or as one people. Different groups had their specific grievances against the British and therefore they fought for the redressal of their specific grievances. For instance, the native rulers did not want the British to take over the territories as it happened to the rulers of Awadh and Jhansi in present day Uttar Pradesh. Similarly, peasants, artisans and tribals suffered at the hands of the British rulers and often stood up in revolt against them. But Merely the opposition to the British rule or a fight against them did not bring about a feeling of nationalism in India. Although different sections of the population got united because of common exploitation at the hands of the British, a feeling of identification with the entire country and its people did not come about. Even the great revolt of 1857 in which many sections of the population fought together like native rulers soldiers, zamidars and the peasants did not produce a feeling of nationalism or an all India unity. The idea that the people of India in spite of many differences among themselves had many things in common against them had not as yet taken roots. Similarly, the realization that the British rule was foreign and an alien rule which wanted to subjugate the entire people and bring them under its control had also not occurred. The essence of nationalism in India or Indian nationalism was the realization that all the Indian people had a common nationality and that it was in their collective interest to resist the British rule. To put it simply, a combined opposition to British rule and a desire to achieve national unity lay at the heart of Indian nationalism. The objective conditions for the development of nationalism were indeed fulfilled by the arrival of the colonial rulers and their penetration into Indian society and economy. However, these conditions in themselves did not create an awareness of nationalism among the people. The consciousness of the idea of nationalism took a long time to mature and made its presence gradually in the field of culture, economy and politics. Now let us read about culture and nationalism. It was in the field of culture that the ideas of nationalism were expressed first. 
This happened at two levels. Firstly, it happened in the form of questioning some of the elements of traditional Indian culture and a desire to bring about reforms in it by removing some socially disadvantaged situations. Secondly, an attempt was also made by the Indians to oppose the British encroachment in the Indian culture. It is important to remember that the colonial conquest did not just mean the replacement of one kind of rulers by another. Its effect penetrated deep down to the lives of the ordinary people in a variety of ways through the efforts of British rulers and their agents the culture of then colonial rulers began to spread among the Indian people. This spread of colonial culture and language produced two responses among the Indian elites. That is, the socially privileged people belonging to a high culture and the upper strata of the society. Some of them began to compare the traditional Indian society and culture with the one that existed in modern England. They thus question some of the elements of the Indian culture. For instance, social reformers like Raja Ram Mohan Roy and Ishwar Chandravidya Sagar worked hard for the eradication of some of the social evils that were a part of the Indian society. In particular, Raja Ram Mohan Roy attacked the practice of sati, that is burning of the widow along with the husband on his death and with their Sagar advocated remarriage of widows. Leaders like Jyoti Bapule initiated anti-caste movements in Maharashtra. They also made an appeal to the colonial rulers to intervene in the Indian society and bring about reforms, although they did not believe that the European culture was superior to Indian culture. They did represent a modernizing force which could help in the development of the Indian society along modern and rational lines. At another level, however, the Indian leaders tried to defend and protect Indian culture against what they thought was an encroachment of the colonial culture into the lives of the Indian people. When attempts were made in the 1850s to impose a European dress and other practices on the Indian people, it was resisted by them. Interestingly, this was also true of those social reformers who admired the British rule and hoped that the colonial rule would, through legislation and other means, introduce modernity in India. Thus, Keshav Chandrasen, a prominent 19th century reformer and a leader of the Brahmo Samaj, which was formed by Raja Ram Mohan Roy in 1828, did not like to wear English dress or eat English food. Similarly, Ishwar Chand Vidya Sagar refused to go to a function hosted by the Lieutenant Governor because he was required to wear European dress. In this approach, cultural rights and practices of the people were seen as very important and the colonial rule was defied on the ground that it was trying to impinge upon them. The two approaches mentioned above may seem to you different and also in conflict with each other. The former approach of questioning the evils of the traditional Indian culture may look different from the later approach of resisting any attempt on the part of the colonial rulers to either appropriate or try to change the local Indian culture. It may appear to you that the first approach invited British intervention in the Indian society, whereas the second approach opposed it. But it is very important to remember that as components of Indian nationalism, both the approaches complemented each other. Now, the idea of cultural nationalism as it developed in the 19th century was based on a firm rejection of some of the negative features of the traditional Indian culture by or its integration into the culture of the colonial rulers. In other words, the 19th century social reformers wanted the Indian culture to become truly modern, but they did not want it to become totally western. In this sense, they were opposed to both the traditional culture but also to the modern colonial culture. This was the essence of cultural nationalism as practiced in 19th century India. Now, we must also know something about the economic nationalism. By this time, I am sure you have understood what is meant by cultural nationalism and what was the relationship between culture and nationalism in India. Now we shall try to understand economic nationalism. The origins of economic nationalism can be traced back to the second half of the 19th century when Indian leaders like Dadabhai Naroji, Mahadev Govind Ranade, 
and Ramesh Chandra Dutt among others began realizing that the British rule was economically exploiting India and that it was largely responsible for keeping India under extreme poverty. From this, a whole generation of Indian leaders like Gopal Krishna Gokhale, Bal Gangadhar Tilak, G. V. Joshi and many others developed a systematic and comprehensive economic critique of the British rule. Following are some of the features of economic nationalism they propounded and preached through their writing. They emphasized that the colonial rule was economically exploiting India in a variety of ways. Now, initially, this exploitation was confined to heavy taxation of the peasantry and the unequal trade with India. It was an unequal trade because the British East India Company, which was granted a monopoly of trade with India by the British Parliament, brought Indian goods very cheap and sold British manufactured goods to India at a very expensive rate. This resulted in India's wealth going to England. It also destroyed the traditional handicraft industries of India. However, in the 19th century, whereas this form of economic exploitation continued, new and more complex forms of exploitation came into being. Now, the colonial rulers exploited India as a supplier of raw material for their industries and a market where the goods produced in the British industries could be sold. India was made to cultivate those raw materials like cotton or jute which were required by British industries. The impact of this was that India's wealth which could have been utilized for India's industrialization and economic development was utilized instead for Britain's economic development. The Indian nationalist leaders learned these vital facts and propagated them at the same time. As a part of their understanding about a steady economic exploitation of India, the nationalist leaders Dada Bhai Naroji in particular propounded the drain theory. Naroji in his famous book Poverty and the Un-British Rule in India written in 1901 and published 1988 argued that India's economic resources were being systematically siphoned off to England through trade industrialization and high salaries to British officials which were being paid by Indian money. According to their calculations, this drain amounted to one half of government revenues and more than one third of India's total savings. It was thus that Britain's enrichment and India's impoverishment were taking place simultaneously. The earliest national leaders thus argued that the British colonial rule in a variety of ways completely subordinated Indian economy to the economy of Great Britain. In their view, the direction of the Indian economy was being geared to suit the needs of the British economy. They demanded an end to the flow of Indian wealth to England and the industrialization of India with the help of Indian capital only, so that it would benefit India and Indian people. In order to achieve this, the nationalist leaders demanded self-rule or self-government or Swaraj for their country. The relevance of economic nationalism as formulated by the nationalist leaders was twofold. First, it demolished the notion generally held by the educated people in the first half of the 19th century that the British colonial government was a benevolent government and would ultimately lead to India's economic development. Many people had believed that if the colonial rule would continue for a long time, India would in the end become prosperous like Great Britain. The Indian nationalist leaders were able to demonstrate that this was wrong thinking and that the British colonial rule was actually harmful to the interest of the Indian people. Secondly, economic nationalism laid the foundation for a powerful nationalist agitation against the British colonial rule we started in the 20th century under the leadership of Mahatma Gandhi and other leaders. These leaders took the ideas of the economic nationalism to the Indian people and thus mobilized them into the national movement. Once the masses of Indian people joined the nationalist movement, it became impossible for the British colonial rule to remain in India. Then let us discuss about religion and nationalism also. Apart from cultural nationalism and economic nationalism, 
there were other ways also in which the idea of Indian nationalism was being expressed. They came into being in the second half of the 19th century, a thinking on Indian nationalism which was based on religion. It was leaders like Bankim Chandra Chattopadhyay, Dayanand Saraswati who founded Arya Samaj in 1875, Vivekanand and Aurobindo Ghosh who made Hindu religion and its ideas the motivating force behind Indian nationalism. They looked upon the British presence in India as an attempt by the western civilization to dominate the Indian civilization. They were completely opposed to this domination. These leaders were convinced that although the British had succeeded in conquering India, the eastern civilization was superior to the western one. Bankim Chandra argued that although the British had conquered India with the help of military and technological superiority, Indians should not start blindly following it. He argued about the uniqueness of the Indian society where the ideas of western civilization could not be applied. These leaders understood the western civilization to be based on the idea of individualism rather than spirituality and found them to be completely unsuitable for India. Vivekanand believed that the western ideas had to be remodeled according to the Indian situation. He said, in Europe, political ideas form the national unity. In Asia, religious ideas form the national unit. These leaders derived their inspiration not from the western text and other sources, but from the traditional Indian text like the Vedas, the Upanishads and Gita. They criticized the British colonial rule mainly on the ground that it was trying to impose an inferior material system on India which was a land rich with spiritual resources. The understanding of nationalism based on religion had a political aspect also. Leaders like Bal Gangadhar Tilak wanted people to take the idea of nationalism to the people. They knew that religion was a very important moral force in the Indian society. Hence, they decided to use religion in the propagation of nationalist ideas. In order to be able to speak to people in the language, that is religious language, Tilak introduced the Ganpati festival in Maharashtra in 1893 to create a religious platform from where nationalist ideas could be preached and spread. This understanding of nationalism based on religion led to two different kinds of political mobilizations in the 20th century. On the one hand, leaders like Mahatma Gandhi welcomed the use of religion for nationalist mobilization, but they did not confine this approach only to Hindu religion. They used the symbols and language of Hinduism, Islam and other religions also. Thus, they tried to bring members of different religious communities into the national movement and also promote unity among them. The second approach was more exclusivist in nature and was reflected in the activities of organizations like the Hindu Mahasabha and the Muslim League. Whereas the leaders of the Hindu Mahasabha confined their activities only to Hindu, those of the Muslim leagues appeal only to Muslims. They also did not develop any understanding of Indian unity of the Indian people or by engaging in persistent opposition to British colonial rule. In the end, it is important for you to remember and understand some aspects of the relationships that existed between various kinds of nationalisms. Although they may seem different from each other, they actually had many things in common. They were different from one another only to the extent that they followed different paths to come to the same destination. They were also not opposed to each other in any fundamental sense. They were all opposed to the British colonial rule, but their opposition was based on different grounds. The advocates of cultural nationalism believed that the colonial rule had started encroaching into Indian culture which should be resisted. The profounders of economic nationalism argued that the colonial rule was economically exploiting India and was the main factor in keeping India backward. Similarly, leaders like Bankim Chandra and Vivekanand opposed the British rule on the ground that it was tempering with their spiritual resources. All the three were opposed to the colonial rule because of its impact on the Indian people. Their ideas helped in the building of a powerful anti-colonial Indian national movement in the 20th century, which finally defeated and overthrew the colonial rule from India. At the end of the program, we can say that the ideas of nationalism first took roots in Europe in the 19th century and was a result of rapid industrialization and the onset of modern industrial economy. Thank you so much.
घर बैठे पाए राष्ट्रीय मुक्त विद्यालय शिक्षा संस्थान यानी एन में एडमिशन वो भी एकदम आसान तरीके से जिससे शिक्षार्थियों को होगी समय और धन दोनों की बचत एन से शिक्षा कभी भी कहीं भी शिक्षार्थियों क्या आप जानते हैं एन में एडमिशन लेने का सरल और सुगम तरीका जिससे शिक्षार्थियों को ऑनलाइन प्रवेश लेने में सहूलियत मिलती है एन में प्रवेश की प्रक्रिया पूर्णतया ऑनलाइन है शिक्षार्थी घर बैठे इंटरनेट द्वारा प्रवेश के लिए सबसे पहले एन की वेबसाइट www.nios.ac.in पर लॉगिन करें अपना ईमेल आईडी और पासवर्ड डालकर अपना पंजीकरण करें पंजीकरण के बाद लॉगिन करने पर ऑनलाइन प्रवेश हेतु आवेदन पत्र खुलेगा आवेदन पत्र को निर्देशानुसार भरें और प्रिंट आउट ले इस प्रिंट आउट पर अपनी फोटो संलग्न करें ऑनलाइन प्रवेश के लिए शुल्क हेतु भुगतान के तरीके हैं क्रेडिट कार्ड के द्वारा डेबिट कार्ड के द्वारा राष्ट्रीयकृत बैंक के ड्राफ्ट के माध्यम से, जो कि सचिव एन नई दिल्ली या नोएडा के पक्ष में देय हो भरे हुए आवेदन पत्र के साथ साथ डिमांड ड्राफ्ट और संलग्न किए जाने वाले दस्तावेज हैं जन्म रजिस्ट्रार के जिला कार्यालय से जारी जन्म प्रमाण पत्र की सत्यापित प्रति जिसमें जन्म तिथि अंकित हो पिछले विद्यालय से प्राप्त विद्यालय छोड़ने का प्रमाण पत्र जिसमें आवेदक की जन्म तिथि लिखी हो प्रवेश फॉर्म का प्रिंट आउट एन के संबद्ध क्षेत्र केंद्रों पर दस दिनों में पहुँच जाना चाहिए अन्यथा उचित दस्तावेज ना लगे होने पर आवेदन फॉर्म रद्द किया जा सकता है प्रवेश प्रक्रिया की पुष्टि होने के बाद शिक्षार्थियों को परिचय पत्र व अध्ययन सामग्री डाक द्वारा तुरंत पहुंचाई जाती है ऑनलाइन प्रवेश एक बहुत ही सुगम और सुविधाजनक प्रवेश प्रणाली है ऑनलाइन ऑन टाइम फॉर सेफ एंड सिक्योर एडमिशन जीवन ये प्रकाशित करने राहों को आलोकित करने हम अपना दीपक स्वयं बने हम अपना रास्ता स्वयं चुने कभी पढ़े हम कहीं पढ़े वे विषय की 